Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Philosophy Hour of Literary Tales. I'm your host, Paul Krauss, and in this episode, we turn to Aristotle's politics to understand his conception of man as a political animal. Aristotle famously said in his great work, The Politics, that man is, by nature, a political animal. What did he mean by this? Why is it important? Aristotle's political philosophy is dependent upon his understanding of human anthropology and ontology, as well as teleology, or the purpose of life. Aristotle wrote in a time that is considered the anthropological epoch of Greek philosophy. Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, the subsequent peripatetics, up to the Stoics and the Neoplatonists were engaged in a two to three hundred year history, a moment in Greek philosophical history that dealt with the nature of mankind. Unlike today, Aristotle's statement is not meant to signify that humans should be politically active, i.e. like political activists. Instead, it signifies that man is a social animal who naturally desires community to be in association with others, and that this desire to be in community and association with others constitutes some level of the good and orderly life that brings about happiness. And the highest manifestation of this community, this association with others, that brings about the good life, order, and happiness is through the polis, the political community. In other words, to be a citizen of a political environment. Just prior to his famous statement that humans are political animals, Aristotle states, we see that every city is some sort of community and that every community is constituted for the sake of some good since everyone does everything for the sake of what seems good. In order to understand Aristotle, it is necessary to understand his philosophical and political anthropology. Philosophical anthropology is the philosophical study of the nature of humans and what it means to be human. It is, in essence, simply the study of human nature. Originally, Anthropology emerged as a theological discipline, first systematized by Judaism and Christianity, but the basic ideas of philosophical anthropology are seen also in the philosophical tradition. The commentaries of Plato, Aristotle, Cicero, Plotinus, which subsequently informed especially the systemized anthropologies of Christianity. For Aristotle, Humanity's telos, its natural end or purpose, is happiness, or eudaimonia. Humans have an innate human nature, according to Aristotle, which is hylomorphic, a combination of matter and form, in Aristotle's full, mature account of what it means to be a human. We can summarize Aristotle's basic human nature as twofold a natural desire to be in community, and a want for happiness, and the fact that happiness is also contingent upon being in a community, or greater happiness is the result of being in a community. One will always be happier in the company of others than alone and isolated. Happiness is not experiential. For that is nothing more than materialistic hedonism, which denies the form of happiness, which is an ontological state of being. Again, this is Aristotle's hylomorphic union of matter and form. The form of happiness is the telos of human nature, our social desires, our communal instincts, wherein when fulfilled, happiness is a result. Again, happiness is not mere bodily pleasure. It is, more importantly for Aristotle, the manifestation of our very purpose, the very purpose of human nature. 
Aristotle does not argue that the purpose of the polis or political community is for the advancement of unfolding history, historicism, which is a 19th century concept, out of common weakness or the state of nature, an idea that emerges in the 17th century, or for socially engineering a utopia. These are all what we in the 21st century, inheritors of the so-called enlightenment traditions of philosophy, have come to think about politics. Aristotle understands the formation of community, of politics, of political community, to simply be the natural, desirable, and spontaneous result of human nature. People in their natural instincts for a want of community and sociality, the happiness and the virtue that derives from being engaged in relationships with others from which our happiness emerges, is the natural formation of community. The natural formation of community, of political society, is the fulfillment of our social nature. Humanity's political nature is the final cause of humanity's innate nature, since happiness can only consummate fully in an involved social and engaged political life. Life in a community, life in a town, life with others. Ultimately, Aristotle makes the argument that humans cannot be truly happy as asocial or solitary beings. This is twofold. First, if human nature is naturally social and communitarian, then to be asocial, atomistic, and solitary is a suppression of your basic human nature and instincts. It is to actually try and to live contrary to nature, and to live contrary to nature will always result in unhappiness. Second, it is almost certainly the case that Aristotle is also waging underhanded slights against the remaining sophists of his day, who advocate pure self-interest, self-advancement in community, rather than working together in unity and harmony. Again, this emphasis on unity, harmony, and order is part and parcel of Aristotle's philosophical project. In the aftermath of the decline of Athens, the chaos that was unleashed because of tyranny and the destruction of the Athenian Imperium during the Peloponnesian War, the quest to find order and happiness in a world of chaos and self-interest demagoguery is a major component of the Greek philosophical project that we associate with Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, and the, and the Stoics. Aristotle is also combating the progenitors of the Epicurean and the Cynic traditions which advocate also detachment from society and living a life in complete isolation from others. Since happiness is the highest good in life, as it is humanity's natural end, so too does political community serve to fulfill this purpose. Aristotle's take here is different from Plato's. In Plato's Republic, especially books five and six, Plato makes the case that while political community is good, it naturally limits the happiness of others. Since order and structure are good, this is what political community brings. It is desirable, even if it restricts some level of happiness. And in Plato, you can also see this quest to find order and structure in a world of chaos and demagoguery. For Plato, politics is entirely negative. It is a result of constriction needed to retain a sense of order and unity from which happiness, though limited, can finally emerge without the danger of tyranny, demagoguery, and chaos. Aristotle takes a different approach. He sees politics as something positive. It is the true manifestation of our nature. The political order in Aristotle is, therefore, good. 
The political community, when fully functioning, is a beautiful portrait of the ebb and flow of the harmony of the pluralistic reality of the world. Each person functions, according to Aristotle, in a different capacity to another. All occupy different levels of the social strata. Each is performing tasks that best suit them, but the rest of the city benefits as a result from this. For instance, the city benefits when soldiers are the best soldiers possible, when farmers are the best farmers possible, when rulers are the best rulers possible, when judges are the best judges possible, when craftsmen are the best craftsmen possible, etc. By being the best in whatever life, whatever career, whatever place in society that you occupy, everyone else also benefits. For instance, if craftsmen were bad craftsmen selling their products that we need, bad craftsmen result in a less functioning, less happy, less well-ordered city. When everyone is fulfilling their social purpose to the best of their ability, everyone benefits. This is the notion of excellence in Aristotle. And excellence is not only pertinent to the individual, it is essential to politics. The good politics fosters virtue or excellence because virtue helps achieve the good life and bring happiness. By being virtuous and excellent in life, happiness is the result. If you are unvirtuous, if you are not excellent at your craft or whatever, uh, whatever you are doing in life, this will result in misery, misery for you and misery for others. Since the polis serves to achieve the purpose of happiness as a contingent expression of human nature, Aristotle makes the case for political and social excellence within the politics and also the Nicomachean ethics. That is, a good politics will necessarily and naturally lead to its citizens cultivating virtue and excellence from among themselves and in relationship to others. The state does not cultivate virtue for us. Aristotle argues that we cultivate virtue for ourselves. It is impossible for the state to produce the excellence and the virtue that is simply innate within humans. While good laws can help further that advancement, ultimately the cultivation of excellence and virtue is an individual endeavor, one that is actually more properly aided in relationship with other people than in relationship to the law and the state. Thus, Aristotle is able to write, a city is excellent because its citizens who participate in the political system are excellent. By being excellent individuals, we become excellent citizens, which results in an excellent and virtuous politics and polis. But now we should devote time to what Aristotle means by advocating for this idea of happiness and excellence independent from the state. While Aristotle believes the state ultimately does derive and is therefore in a sense natural as a result of political community, it is not that the state has any teleological purpose, say as it does in the political philosophy of Hegel or even John Locke or Thomas Hobbes. The state is the outflow of purely human instincts and human desires. For Aristotle, a state that becomes too large becomes inefficient and often oppressive and slips into decay and corruption. This was obviously the case with the Athenian Empire that Aristotle critiques without actually saying so. If a state becomes too large, it becomes inefficient, oppressive, corrupt, and then it is destroyed. All of these things result in the abuse of the citizenry, the limitation of happiness, 
and the suppression of our human nature. Yes, too big, therefore, is a problem. Those who advocate for a big or a large state, a big or large bureaucratic system, clearly have never read Aristotle. At the same time, a state, however, that is too small, also fails to achieve the consummation of virtue, excellence, and happiness for human life and existence. An ineffective state, one that is too small, is unable to codify the natural law, defend itself from attack, and is prone to limitations on happiness, not for the reasons of a too large state, but for the reasons of a too minimal state. For instance, if other people who live in a larger community decide to invade you and your ineffective tiny state cannot protect you, you are going to suffer as a result. Thus, we see the Aristotelian notion of the golden mean found even in Aristotle's politics. Thus, when reading Aristotle, one should understand that when he proclaims man to be a political animal, what he really means by today's language is that we are social animals and that our happiness, our virtue, our cultivation of human excellence is a result of having friendship with others and rights and duties within political society. Politics, in Aristotle's account, is not about ideology. It is not about the achievement of an end of history or a utopia. It is not about political activism to achieve a socially engineered state. Instead, it is a naturally occurring and growing process that is related to humanity's natural desires. Social relationships, the happiness that result from social relationships, the happiness that is enhanced and manifested by being an excellent human being in relationship, especially with others, that is the essence of political life. Political life, then, for Aristotle, is living a life in community, being excellent for yourself for the sake of others. Aristotle's community that forms is a result of this innate desire for sociality and happiness. Those who live a life detached from community, detached from others, who lack social relationships, are people who are suffering, who are miserable, who are unhappy. This, of course, is the result of also a tyrannical state. A tyrannical state achieves the isolation and the loneliness of its people. And in that loneliness and isolation, we become weak. For Aristotle, a strong humanity is a result of having strong social relationships. In modern parlance, Aristotle advocates for a weak state, but a strong social society, a strong civil society. Through a strong civil society, we achieve the maximum happiness of having relationships with other human beings, having relationships with friends, being excellent in our jobs and in our duties to others. Each person forms an important part of the political whole, the political body. Part of one's vocational excellence wherein they are fulfilled as, for instance, farmers, laborers, or managers, whatever it is, is by becoming excellent in that specific vocation, and in that excellence, everyone else who you know and those who you don't even know benefit from your excellence, and you achieve happiness because of it, and everyone else achieves happiness as a result of your own excellence and happiness. And this produces the well-ordered, virtuous, and happy city. Virtue, at the end of the day, is the ultimate product, the ultimate aim of sociality and happiness, because the highest degree of happiness emerges for you and for everyone when you are excellent and your friends are excellent. When everyone is virtuous, everyone is happy, and you your friends, your neighbors, and the entire political community becomes excellent 
and happy as a result.